Good afternoon and welcome to UK Column Live. It's uh, Friday the 20th of uh, December 2013, just after one o'clock. I'm your host this afternoon, Brian Gerrish, Mike Robinson behind the scenes with the IT gear. And we're going to be joined later in the programme by Guy Taylor, who's going to be giving us some very good news about what's been happening in the courts. Uh, weather, well, yes. It's basically dry at the moment, a bit on the cold side, but I'm quite sure we can expect uh, more of the same or possibly variation. So rain, sunshine, dry, bit of snow, but probably not in uh, this part of Devon. OK, well, there's only one thing worse than leading off with Tony Blair, and that's got to be Gordon Brown. Mike? In, indeed. So uh, Gordon Brown has been writing in The New York Times uh, and he says, I'm just going to quote a little bit of what he says. He says, the economist David Miles, who sits on the Monetary Policy Committee of the Bank of England, may exaggerate when he forecasts, fa forecasts financial crises every seven years. But most of the problems that caused the 2008 crisis, excessive borrowing, shadow banking, reckless lending, have not gone away. Too big to fail banks have not shrunk. They've grown bigger. Huge bonuses that encourage reckless risk taking by bankers remain the norm. Meanwhile, shadow banking, investment and lending services by financial institutions that act like banks, but with less supervision, has exp expanded in value to $71 trillion from $59 trillion in 2008. And he goes on to say, Europe's lenders aren't the only ones with these blind spots. Uh, emerging market economies in Asia and Latin America have seen a 20% growth in their shadow banking sectors. And he says, international rules, so this is really the crux of what it's about, International rules are needed for international banks. Without them, the international monetary, as the International Monetary Fund has warned, global banks will evade regulation, quote, by moving operations, ch changing corporate structures and redesigning products. Uh, in short, precisely what world we leaders sought to avoid, a global financial free-for-all enabled by ad hoc unilateral actions is what has happened. Uh, and he says, political expediency, a failure to think and act globally and a lack of courage to take on vested interests are pushing us inexorably towards the next crash. And of course, he's absolutely right in most of what he says, because he was one of the engineers of the financial crisis. Uh, so he should know better than anybody else uh, what the truth and the reality of the uh, current financial system is. Uh, but nonetheless, his solution to the problem that he created is to create these uh, international rules, these global uh, banking union, effectively taking the European banking union model even further. That's what he wants. Uh, so he's not offering any real solutions, uh, just more of the same. Uh, and of course, how much gold did he sell off? Uh, 400 tonnes, was it, of Britain's gold, Mike? I can't remember the exact uh, amount, but it was certainly a lot. And then, of course, what happened, the price of the euro fell. So a double uh, whammy for the uh, British nation there. Well, you brought that in so smoothly, Brian, that you would almost have thought well, we spoke about this beforehand. But I just wanted to remind everybody about this article in the mail from a year ago. Queen gives bank chiefs a ticking off over the over crash as she visits the vaults. And this was really what it was about, where it's a, the, this photo, uh, these photo shots uh, over the Queen looking at uh, the huge amounts of gold sitting in uh, London gold vaults. Um, well, this story is really about this man, uh, Kenneth Hoffman, who is basically, uh, he is uh, at Bloomberg Industries. He's a commentator on Bloomberg. And he, I'm just going to quote what he said because it's, uh, it's pretty uh, amazing what he's saying. The biggest story is what has happened to the gold. You can go into a vault. You could go into a vault, vault in London a couple of years ago and they were packed to the rafters with gold uh, and the gold would trade from me to you to somebody else. You can walk in those vaults today and they're virtually empty. All that gold has been transferred out of London, 26 million ounces. Uh, it's gone to Switzerland, uh, where it has been recast into a higher grade and shipped off to Hong Kong and then to China, never to return. Uh, so the question I'd like to ask then is, um, was, was this picture of the Queen reviewing the gold? Was she saying goodbye to it at that point? Um, he's basically saying that these gold vaults are now empty. Uh, and of course, if there is a... If there is a desire for gold um, as a result of Gordon Brown's uh, forthcoming financial crash, uh, there is no gold uh, to meet the demand. Uh, so what's going to happen to the gold price? I think that's a fairly, uh, fairly important question. So that's me. 
Well, they've done it, haven't they, really? Or we're at least seeing behind what's, uh, what's now going on with these people. But I just wanted to add Gordon Brown, of course, um, after his short um, holiday, uh, after being prime minister, then disappeared off to the United Nations, where he was one of the lead figures in education policy, uh, which, of course, would have kept him in touch with children. Uh, do we really want this man helping to frame the United Nations educational policy? Uh, of course, a key part of which, as we've been exposing, has been to drift in uh, gross sexualization or over sexualization of children. So quite what Gordon Brown's agenda is, uh, that remains to be seen. We'll also remind you, of course, that if you read his biography, uh, don't buy it, but borrow a copy from somewhere. But he tells uh, the author says very clearly that, uh, of course, uh, Gordon Brown was helped into power by the Scottish communists. Well, that fits in very nicely, really, with the lead through into what we're now seeing, which is the uh, cross party Alinsky policy um, beginning to hit home across the country. What sort of people are we dealing with in our um, parliament and amongst the MPs? Well, we're going to show you which really sums up for, the, uh, for this year. So we're going to start with uh, Camp Delta. So the independent here um, talking about uh, Britain's role in Al-Qaeda renditions. Um, we're now slowly but surely beginning to see information come up to the surface. MI6 agents in Afghanistan were told that they were not obliged to intervene if they witnessed suspected terrorists being harmed by their American captors. An official inquiry into allegations Britain was complicit in torture has disclosed. So we're getting to the meat of the thing that basically here we've got uh, once again uh, Britain's government complicit in torture. But of course, with the usual double standards, um, it was OK for those MI6 operatives to turn a blind eye to torture. But if you're part of Britain's battlefield troops and you're out there having to do the job on the ground, well, betide you if you do something wrong, because you're going to get a minimum of 10 years in prison. So who is controlling Britain's uh, secret services? Is it the politicians? We don't think so. At the end of the day, it's controlled by the bankers who are running the whole corrupt show anyway. If we just pop that one back on screen, Mike, we've also, I just wanted a highlight here. You can make of this what you like, but of course we've got the good old satanic uh, symbol there in the middle of Camp Delta. It labels itself as the Joint Detention Group, which is all pretty nudge and we're a cuddly sort of organization. But what Britain and, of course, America are fully engaged in is torture. Well, this is a bit of a worry, of course, for this, this man, Mr. Straw. Uh, so he told MPs on Thursdays, as Foreign Secretary, I acted at all times in a manner which was fully consistent with my legal duties with national and international law. And I was never in any way complicit with the unlawful rendition or detention of individuals by the United States or any other state. Well, what do we say to that? I think it's very clearly this. Methinks thou does protest too loudly. So are we about to start are we about to see our senior judiciary starting to bring these people to book? How can we as a so-called a supposedly civilized Western nature being openly engaging in torture? while criticising Iraq or Syria, uh, for example, uh, for that very same offence. We need to bring Gordon Brown, Tony Blair and uh, our little schoolboy Cameron into the courts for the actions that have taken place under all their names and as soon as possible. Meanwhile, of course, as a result of these uh, terrible actions, we are going to get a response. And so the Express here coming up with... Uh, a story as a result of the um, result of the trial uh, around the murder of Lee Rigby. Um, well, the headline MI5 was under mounting pressure last night over its attempts to recruit one of the killers of Fusilier Lee Rigby as a spy. And we'd just like to bring in this lady. Here she is, Cressida Dick, Met Assistant Commissioner. Let's remember this lady is a senior common purpose. Uh, woman, almost a guru, according to some of the officers around her who, who say that she behaves at times quite strangely. 
Uh, this is what she had to say. Um, basically, she confirmed that uh, Ada Bellagio was known to the intelligence services before the murder. And speaking after the conviction, she told BBC's Panorama, he certainly was somebody we knew about and at various stages were concerned about. He was on our radar, to which we say, why didn't you do something about it? Were you too busy doing your duties as a future uh, world leader under, under common purpose? Well, we're not really surprised as to what goes on here. Uh, let's take a look at um, what UK column um, discovered on this whole matter some time ago. Um, so here we've got uh, Michael raised as a Christian and uh, we've got his, his uh, uh, so, so this is, sorry, this is the key bit here, raised as a, a Christian and this is the two parts of this matter as it unfolded. So these guys met at uh, Greenwich University. Uh, they were friends with British soldiers. So we're told that, of course, the hatred was there from the beginning. Uh, but uh, Lance Corporal Kirk uh, Redpath, who unfortunately was killed in Iraq in 2007, was actually a very close friend. Well, where did it go? Well, recruited by MI5 at university with the aim of infiltrating Muslim groups. And in 2010 was sent to work for Al-Qaeda in Somalia, a country, of course, which we're now seeing uh, has started to erupt um, 2010, arrested in Kenya under suspicion of involvement with CIA Al-Qaeda plot. Family claim he was tortured before being deported to Britain, where he was pestered by MI5. And in 2012, he contacted a lawyer over what he regarded as MI5 harassment. Do we think this man was lying? Was his family lying? Or was he trying to tell the truth about people uh, attacking him psychologically? And if we come through the other side, um, Mr. Adebowala, he was involved with Nigerian and Somali gangs. Uh, he eventually ended up in Fel Feltham Youth Offenders Institution. He converts to Islam, but according to the authorities, undergoes personality changes. Was this applied behavioural psychology, we wonder? Uh, there was some reports in the mirror talking about these issues of personality changes, uh, but that information was quickly taken down from the mirror website. We wonder why. Pressure from our security forces, perhaps. And then the BBC starts to report. And where does this take us? Back to MI5 harassment and MI5 sp sponsored torture in Kenya. So he's eventually arrested by the Met Police and held at Southwark Police Station. And well, this brings us straight back to the British government and Malcolm Rifkin, Conservative Chair of the UK Intelligence and Security Committee. And remember, of course, that Malcolm Rifkin declared friend of Israel. So when he's operating as chair of our Intelligence and Security Committee, is he working in the best interests of Britain or is he indeed working for Israel? Well, whatever he did, he defended MI5. So we know that there's some very dirty dealing going on here. But what is very clear, Britain's security services and senior members of the government complicit in torture. Welcome to Britain 2013. Well, I've got a picture of um, a Mirror article here talking about uh, uh, Felton Prison. If we can bring that one up, Mike. Thank you. Uh, here we are. So gang member and drug dealer Michael Abadwala was radicalised in jail at 17. So how did that actually happen? How do you get radicalised in jail? Who is actually playing with your mind? Fellow inmates or could it be part of the jail's own training uh, system? Well, this is an old article, but let's think about what this woman is saying. So we've got Dame Stella Rimmington. The enemy is everywhere. Former MI5 head calls for people to spy on their neighbours following the murder of soldier Lee Rigby. Uh, she's 78 years old. She spoke at the Hay Festival, where they have a wonderful fire festival. I'll leave you to think about that one. She was MI5's first female director. 
she thinks that everybody should spy on each other. This was the whole article. Uh, but let's scroll down because something pretty interesting comes up. She said further terror attacks on the UK were inevitable unless the country became a police state. Do we need to make up that there is something very strange going on in UK when we have uh, former head of MI5, Dame Stella Rimington, simply telling us that she and, of course, her devious colleagues believe that Britain needs to become a police state. And that, of course, is what we're starting to see. Well, since we're coming up to Christmas, we probably need a bit of good news. And we're going to go to Valley News uh, because uh, a person kindly sent us some information the other day, which we found wonderful. Uh, what it was to do with was open letters to this gentleman, Councillor Peter Edge. And this was one of the particular letters that had been sent to him and was actually published. I think I can just about read this, but we're still looking for those very elusive glasses at the moment. The plan is for dissent, anger and frustration. I was most interested to read your editorial in November Valley News. I do not believe that you are a naive person in any way, far from it. The answer to all your questions is so simple. It is all planned that way. None of our political puppets, whether national or local, are stupid, incompetent or whatever. They all work to a pre-planned agenda drawn up by their masters Brussels, the central banks and big corporations. The breakup and breakdown of British society, morality, families, industry, communication, communities, etc. is all part of divide and rule. Get yourself a copy of Rules for Radicals by Saul Alinsky and Leading Beyond Authority by Julia Middleton, Common Purpose, and it will instantly become very, very clear. Marxist Alinsky ideology in, in, is acknowledged in writing in both the Tory, Lib and Labour manifestos. Food parcels, invited immigration, low pay, unemployment, etc. are all planned to cause dissent, anger and frustration. Dissent, if pushed hard enough, brings people onto the streets and bingo, call in the EU police, the Civil Contingencies Act, full censorship, curfews, clamp down on free speech, meetings, etc. You've got it, the dictatorship has arrived. Have a watch of the movie V for Vendetta. It's all there, the shape of things to come, unless more people wake up, stand up and say no. Immigrants per se are not to blame. They're invited in on purpose to increase the squeeze. Big pay for council top brass and MPs pay rises and perks, of course, more dissent. www.ukcolumn.org is the place for the real truth, answers and the fight back and agenda. I rest my case, James Pelleen. So what an amazing article to appear in the national press. We couldn't have summed up some of the things that we've been reporting better than that. So thank you very much for sending it in to us. And really that letter sets out how to deal with what's happening around, around us. We've got to expose it, but we've also got to stand up, say no, not in our name, and take action, peaceful action. We thought we'd take a little look, of course, at our politicians and their uh, morality and characteristics. And um, Ed Miliband has been uh, languishing in the background for some time. Uh, but he's vowed to rid Britain of the crack cocaine gambling and stop the high st stake epidemic. So he's got very uh, hot under the collar about uh, uh, gambling machines, basically. And uh, he's, uh, he's now making a big thing about it. We think this is simply detracting from the real issues. We've got corrupt, fraudulent bankers. We've got corrupt Westminster politicians. We've got British people who can't feed themselves. And we've got torture facilitated by the Brit British government security services. Well, the list goes on. So that's Labour for you. Uh, where do we go? Well, we've got to go to David Cameron because he's been lying again and again over wars, economy, Europe, NHS. And during his time as leader of the opposition, he promoted social service and social action, advancing the green agenda. And he said he was going to protect the National Health Service as a top priority. 
Well, unfortunately for Mr. Cameron, telling lies has risks. Uh, this is what happens. So this is the selfie picture that uh, Cameron took uh, with a lovely lady from Denmark and somebody from America. I can't quite identify the chat with him. Let's have a look at that in more detail. And if you look carefully, you can see that just like Pinocchio, David Cameron's nose has grown really quite dramatically. So if you needed cheering up for Christmas, uh, you're going to look forward to seeing David Cameron with a very long nose indeed on most of those graphic TV shots. Life's fun, isn't it, really? Well, let's move on to uh, praise people where praise is justified. And uh, we're going to bring on to our screens one of Britain's judges. Should, should, sorry, Mike, it's my, my fault. There we go. Well, there we are. Uh, this is the mail um, with an article which actually appeared yesterday, anger of the judge forced to resign for championing marriage. Sir Paul Coleridge says only one or two colleagues are opposed to his views. And he's basically been given a formal warning for judicial misconduct. Uh, he's being pushed out. Um, what's this man done? Uh, what does he do? Well, here it is. He's been rebuked for campaigning in favour of marriage. Um, he claimed yesterday that he'd got strong backing within the judiciary. Sir Paul Coleridge said only one or two of his colleagues were opposed to his traditional views. But he spoke out after being given a formal warning by Lord Chief Justice Lord Thomas and Justice Secretary Chris Grayling for judicial misconduct. An inquiry by the Office for Judicial Complaints, the body that polices the behaviour of judges, had found his speeches and newspaper articles were incompatible with his judicial responsibilities. So let's just have a look at the people who are attacking this man. Well, here, here he is, Justice Secretary Chris Grayling. So we now know very clearly he's anti-marriage and anti-family. And here is little cohort, Lord Chief Justice Lord Thomas. So many lords there, it's a wonder he can... Uh, get them all inside. Uh, he's anti-marriage and anti-family. Mike? Yeah, don't forget it's Lord John Thomas. It's Lord John Thomas, that's correct. So we'd like to say um, to um, Judge Coleridge, uh, thank you very much for having the courage to start to speak out about this corrupt cross-party agenda that's coming in. It's clearly cost you in respect of your career. But at the end of the day, we need to see good men and women, wherever they are, NHS, police or judiciary, starting to say, no, we're not accepting this. And we're going to start to put our head above the parapet and speak out. So for those of you who've contacted us in the past to say that the trouble is all of Britain's judges are corrupt, uh, we're going to gently say we've never believed that. And I think we're starting to see some very encouraging signs where some of these good men and women are coming forward. And on that note, we're going to try and speak to this gentleman, uh, Guy Taylor, who's been a fantastic campaign, not only to expose massive fraud and corruption amongst Britain's banks, uh, but he's also been challenging the system by going into court. And he should have some very good news for us today. Are you there, Guy? Yes, Brian, I am. How are you doing? Uh, fine. Well, this is a new experience for me because I've got you on the screen at the back. And uh, can you hear me OK? Yeah, I'm hearing fine, Brian. OK. Well, uh, we were sent um, a newspaper article which came through to us this morning. And basically it, um, it said that you've been in court, you've won a case which has resulted in the Crown Prosecution Service, Service having to pay you costs. Tell us a bit about what you've been up to. Right. Well, I can say the whole story in a row before I can go to the issues involved. Um, but what the circumstances were, uh, um, my father died in 2005 and I inherited a lot of property all over Hereford. And at first, you know, I'd been pretty much a free spirit prior to that. And um, first, first and foremost, I paid off a £45,000 electric bill to British Gas and all various bills for the estate. Well, then um, I started getting ridiculous bills and I started examining them. And th this was when I drew a line in the sand with, at that point with the uh, electrical companies. 
Um, what I discovered was that one of our properties, uh, an old public house with 11 flats in it, while my dad was alive, both British Gas and Empire had been taking direct debits out of his account to the tune of uh, 20,000 quid. So um, I immediately questioned both British Gas and Empire, and they both uh, claimed it. They, they were the suppliers. It resulted in British Gas being the supplier and Empower uh, having no contract. So I then spent a few months trying to get this money off Empower, and this kept putting me round and round in circles. So what I decided to do, because I couldn't get this money, um, I decided not to do a practical lien on them. And I, I mean by that, every time they sent me, Empower sent me a bill for any of our properties, uh, I uh, didn't pay the bill. Wait until they took me to court for a human rights notification to turn the electric off. And then I went to the court and I said, I may owe them £600, but they owe me 20000 And of course, a human rights notification is done in a magistrate's court. Um, and the first time I went there, perhaps four or five years ago, uh, it, they said, no, you don't go into the court. You, know, um, you either pay the bill or they rub a stamp against you in there. And I said, there's a, there's a, there's a, a, a court document with my, my name on it. So I demand her address. So I went into the court and uh, I basically said, they owe me 20 grand, I can prove it. Magistrates didn't really know what to do. So they adjourned it for a month, for uh, uh, power to argue the, the, the point on it. Uh, went back a month later, didn't bother, it was just a bailiff there, he didn't know anything about it. So they ruled in my favor, which meant that they, uh, power at this stage weren't allowed to cut off any of our electrics. So I thought, okay, that's fine. I then got, I then got into a situation. If I don't know if you can see this on here, it's a map. I don't know if you can see it. But uh, it's, a of, it's a map of properties, which are relevant to this. All colours are, are oh, sorry. Okay. All colours are the areas of, of, of property we own, anyway. Uh, uh, so, what what I did was I. Uh, British Gas claimed that I owed them £7,000 on another property. This is not Empire now, this is British Gas. And British Gas said I owed them £7,000. I said, that's ridiculous because we don't earn enough rent on that property. There's no electric being used. And it was on one of our properties that used to be a canteen of a factory. And the fact When they cut electric off, half the factory went behind our properties. I realised that we'd been paying the factory's bills for perhaps for years and they hadn't disconnected it from the canteen. So what I did then was I about 20 foot away on another piece of land we've got was our end pan number and our main supply for a yard that we, was, that we have there. So what I did was I got someone to put an armoured cable across from the one unit, the end power unit into, onto the British gas cable under the road. We, we closed the road off for the day. So technically, it looked like it was still in British Gas's uh, remit, but it wasn't. It was coming from just 20 foot over the road. And I, we carried on using electric. And after three or four years, I thought Empower will have actually paid me what they owe me. In the meantime, Empower kept taking me back to court every three months with a new human rights notification. So I had to go because if I didn't go, they were rubber stamped against me. And this went on 14 times. So I had 14 court cases, every one which we won. And I took... Uh, Roger Hayes with me and, and uh, Veronica and you know everyone came with John Hurst and in the end we threatened to arrest the, the magistrates and uh, if they didn't do their duty and dismiss it once and for all because the clerks were screaming they can't use the magistrates court as an appeal process to be a judicial review yeah so the, all this activity was going on well get to the story now so I've got these two properties which one was connected by British Gas one was connected by Empower. But what has now happened is I've unseemly connected the Empire up to the British Gas one. So I get a phone call by a, a bailiff saying that uh, we're stealing British Gas's electric. And he's a British Gas revenue collector. So I said, no, we're not. So anyway, they kicked the door in and cut the electric off and took my landlord's meter. Because it was my landlord's meter I had in there. It wasn't a, it wasn't a, a, a main utility company meter. So... Uh, I then ring the police when I found out about this and report a burglary. They said, uh, it's a civil matter. I said, no, it's not, right? I wasn't supplying these people. Where did they get the warrant from? Blah, 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 blah. 
So I went down to court, and the court said, we haven't given them a warrant. So I thought, right, we'll, we'll in, look into this. But we started looking into it. And, of course, we started discovering set, well, process and procedure. The, you know, it's gone. You know, it really has. Um, so what, what happened then was that the uh, next thing is the police arrest me in the march. It took them a couple of months. And when they arrested me, they arrested me like, uh, with about five or six vans and nine police officers came around, handcuffed me in the house and arrested me and dragged me out. So in the police station, uh, you know, which is it very interesting. We technically quite talk in some matters. But anyway, I said to the police, right, you've arrested me for, for what? And they said, obstructing electricity and fraud, £5,000. So I said, right. Can you show me the warrant? And they said, we haven't got a warrant. We don't need a warrant. I said, no, the warrant that started all this up, the right of entry warrant. Uh, yes, I've got it in my case, the policewoman said when we were in the interview. I said, well, we can't move on till you show it me. And of course, she said, no, it's in there somewhere. I said, show it me. So this went on. She carried on 14 times, I asked her. And I said, you haven't got a warrant, have you? And if you haven't got a warrant, then my arrest was unwarranted. And the people that broke in my building that I reported to you, you believe them on, on the back of what they've said, rather than me reporting the burglary of the premises, which you said was a civil matter. Anyway, so they, they said, right, well, we're going to bail you. And I said, well, you're not going to bail me because I won't accept bail. You'll charge me. You'll let me go. Well, you're going to be bailed. Well, please, bail is a myth. It doesn't exist. It's consensual. So I said, I'm not signing anything because I'm not on bail. So he said, well, you're out anyway. So... Out I went for a month. And of course, I didn't bother answering the bail because I wasn't on bail. Uh, so it is that simple. So the next thing they left notes on the gate, please be a good fellow and come down the police station. Uh, I then went, I'd already been to the magistrate's court and issued a summons against the two bailiffs uh, for burglary. So now, anyway, the police uh, got me in the end, come and got me again for a second time. Um, again, massive gangling came around over the top and uh, dragged me off. When I then went to, uh, uh, and took me to court then in the morning, um, so then they got a court case against me and I'm trying to get a court case against British Gas. So what I've done is the Hereford Magistrate Court, we were very efficient people in there, the clerks said, I've contacted British Gas, but they won't tell me um, any information under the data protection, even though I'm a clerk of the court. So anyway, then this carries on. So that he, he then finds out that the warrant, uh, he can't find out about warrant, sorry, I apologise. And then the day before I'm supposed to be issuing the private criminal prosecution against British gas uh, employees for burglary, um, a warrant turns up. And so they said, oh, that's it, then here's the warrant. Well, when they gave me the warrant, um, again, if you can see it, if I could show you, it, it was written on British gas notepaper. And it was clearly not a court warrant. Uh, written on British Gas and notepaper, and the writing on it, by now I'd, by now I'd started to... Uh, yeah, we, can't, yeah we, we, haven't can't, got, yeah. we haven't got the video yeah. quality yeah. for that guy. Uh, uh, okay, okay. So um, I said, this isn't a warrant. So I wrote to Neath and Port Talbot Courts, and the, the clerk of the court in Hereford wrote to me saying he'd never heard of an, a no-notice warrant for such a matter, and in a different jurisdiction. So I contacted Neathan Port Talbot, which is about 120 miles from here, and uh, said, can you give me the, the, the details of the information that was laid to establish this warrant? And they couldn't give me any details. So in the court depositions for the case against me, ongoing with the Crown Court, they gave me some uh, handwritten documents by the bailiffs. And I then discovered, you don't have to be a forensic expert to realise, it was he who'd written the warrant out. Well, under the 1954 um, rights of entry warrant, if you read it, it says it has to be written under the hand of the magistrate. So clearly, unless the magistrate's totally disabled and can only sign his signature, perhaps, uh, it was fraudulent. I, I then asked for, the, for the, who the magistrate was, and it wouldn't go anywhere. So instead of the burglary charge being taken away, I then uh, issued uh, a pervert call to justice and uh, issued an information against I was already charged them with the obstruction. We then went to court for the, to prosecute, lay the information against the British gas workers, showed all the evidence to the, to the judge in the case, in the magistrate's court, and um, 
he said that uh, he could see there was merit in what we were in what I was saying, or what we were saying, because there was a few of us there. But um, because of the, the case running against me, it would be vexatious to allow it to continue until after the case against me went forward. We'll move on now a year. So it's, it's nearly two years now. I've had this thing hanging my, over my head. So I, 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 I'd fought at the magistrate court to get this to my case heard. And I'd said, listen, I, I want to enforce hostile committal proceedings. And that means that if someone charges you with something, you're entitled to have a summary examination of the, of the evidence to establish whether there's a prima facie case, whether there's a case against you. And the, the judge said, no, that's gone, you know, that's... You know. I said, no, it hasn't. It's, it's a common law uh, issue here, and, and it's not gone. And I showed in case law where people had used it, solicitors had used it, uh, when they'd been uh, disbarred and things. And I showed him also that uh, because it was a common law matter, that, that we were entitled to produce that, and in extraordinary circumstances, it could be used. And these were extraordinary circumstances. But he wouldn't, he wouldn't have it. So then, now I'm on bail for a year, going backwards and forwards to the Crown Court. Um, of course, it becomes more and more obvious that these, these documents are fraudulent. We, upon getting more information, we can clearly see on other writing that he's written the same address down twice and, as the one on the warrant. Well, then, the trial was supposed to take place in July. And, uh, of course, I refused to plead to anything uh, because I haven't done anything wrong. If I haven't done anything wrong, then... What we all went on, uh, I'm going to ask the judge's professional details if you just to make sure he's operating uh, correctly. But it ended up we, we had a very, very good judge, it felt, at the first hearing, at the, the hearing in July. And he said, this case has gone on too long. And uh, I said uh, to the prosecutor before the start of it, I will uh, give you the opportunity now to certify and attest in front of me that this warrant you're using against me in this trial is uh, certifying and test that it's, it's correct and it's, it's totally legal. And he said, uh, I'm not prepared to do that. I said, why? He said, because I don't have to. I said, if you're going to use this document as evidence, evidence against me in a criminal trial, which I've been threatened with two years in prison, then I can assure you, you need to certify and attest it, or else I'm not only going to tell the judge, I will tell any jury exactly So, of course, he was, uh, he was a bit taken aback. He said, they've got crown immunity. I said, you haven't. You've got, you're fully per, per commercially liable to me. You know, that's a myth that you live under that assumption. Um, if, you're using, if you're using fraudulent documents to convict me of something and you're not prepared to say that they're, they're legitimate, then I'm afraid you are operating under full commercial liability. So it went forward from there. And um, we started examining all... Um, all process and procedure uh, on, on matters. And we went, then went to the, uh, the court and we, we went ready for a trial. And when we went there ready for a trial, the next time the prosecution said, oh, no, they need an adjournment for whatever reason. No, they hadn't, they hadn't, a couple of the witnesses hadn't turned up. So the judge said, right, it's going to be heard next time. And he apologized to me and said, uh, it will be heard next time for trial. Then I then spent three or four months getting uh, a warned list. So every week I'm ringing up the court, uh, looking under the internet to see what the court, uh, whether I was on the court list. This happened, uh, went on, and then on Monday we had the trial. Um, so we went there, all ready for battle, uh, myself and my, uh, my, my good woman. And um, we took all our documents, everything else. I was going to take, uh, I was going to take my, my big whiteboard so I could uh, use it to demonstrate to the jury about all these matters. And when we went uh, into the court, I saw the prosecutor, the one that I had the, the talk to, his name was Connolly. And, I, and so I was waving at him to come over so we could discuss what was going to go on. And he, he, he ran off. Well, he disappeared. He ran off. I went around looking around the court for him. I went into the barrister's rooms. He wasn't anywhere in the court building, which was odd. We then went up. There was a new prosecutor. And the new prosecutor then said, um, I've only just got this case. Um, I would like to adjourn because uh, I haven't obviously haven't had time to study it. And he said, but on, based on your last comments to the judge, he said, based on your last comments at the last hearing, I presume that this will fall on stony ground. And the judge said, it certainly will. Okay, he's got 15 minutes to uh, 
speak to your clients, which is a very interesting phrase in criminal court, speak to your clients and decide what you want to do. And he said, ask my permission. If, if they, I would allow them the adjournment of 15 minutes. And I said, yes, no problem. Well, 15 minutes later, they're running around like headless chickens. Um, and then they come back in and they say, uh, uh, I, I don't believe that there... At first, they said there was something wrong with one of the documents established my case and proved my case. Uh, I, I believe that's the Echo's meter reading, which said there was zero electricity being used at that point. But... I don't really think it was that. I think what well, it was that, amongst other things. I think the the, the fraudulent warrant was a, a serious issue, and he said, "Look, we can't continue uh, because I don't think we get me to establish a prima facie case by half time." So the judge said, "Right, it's taken you two years to get to the trial on two occasions to realise that you haven't got a case to answer. They he hasn't got a case to answer." And they said, "Yes," and I said, "That's exactly what I've been saying all the all along." And that's if we'd had the uh, old-style committal with the summary examination of the evidence back last year, I wouldn't be in this position. And I argued with the, the district judge at that hearing that if you send me to Crown Court, based upon no evidence, only documents that are fraudulent, yeah, without being able to meet for me to summary examine the evidence and establish that there is no evidence, you're going to be commercially liable to me. I said, that's the way it, it's got to be that way. Otherwise, I'm going to suffer a tort for the next year based upon a case that's got no, got no legs. And of course, I established that was correct. So going back to the trial, you know that this is uh, this is going to be serious repercussions with this, don't you? And uh, the prosecutor said, yes. And he said, uh, right. He said, uh, oh, Mr. Taylor, he, he didn't dismiss the case. He said, I'm finding you not guilty. The same as if a jury found you not guilty. So you're, you now are not guilty, and I'm awarding you uh, defendant's costs against the Crown Prosecution Service so the last two years. So <laughs> when, now the point being this, Brian, if when he said your clients, now if you're in a crime, if, you know, if you've gone and hit someone, you're not, uh, the person who's been hit isn't a client of the CBS. So whether the, there's, and I don't know, you know, whether the these, uh, because my argument was if, if any power had taken me to court, and, and they, what they did when they took me to court, what they said was, um, um, they wrote me a letter saying if, if I gave them the £12,000, they'd withdraw the case. Well, as far as I was concerned, that was blackmail. You know, were they blackmailing me to, to drop? And I thought, no, I'm not dropping the case. You know, and I'd already been told that I'd get two years. But I thought, no, right at the end of the day, if you put a gun at my head, be prepared to pull the trigger, you know? And um, that's where we went. So there was myself and my wife against the, the, the CPS, and... Uh, and it removed. And the judge was, uh, I, I stood up and then said, I did my usual rumbling, you know, speaking instead of shouting at the civil court judge. I said, the civil court has been completely corrupted and, you know, um, you know uh, for all the, the troubles I've had with them, it's, uh, it's comforting to, to know that, uh, you know, you, you, you've uh, upheld justice today and, and done the correct thing, I said, and I salute you. Yeah. I said, uh, justice is alive and well in the criminal realm well, it has been established here today because you know we have no faith in the civil courts whatsoever. We know they're, we know that they're basically operating under fraud all the time. So, so at the end of the day, we got the um, we've got the two years of the hassle of that. We've got serious issues with British Gas. And what I did yesterday, I went down to uh, the magistrate's court in Hereford to relay the charges uh, against British Gas and other people I'm issuing uh, prosecutions against. So I went back down there and I had a laugh with the security guys on the door. And as I went in, one of the clerks, who's a very, very uh, efficient and professional man, uh, and he's been in there 34 years, as he walked past, he, he said, Guy, Guy, um, you're on page three of the Hereford Times. And I, I said, what? You know, so I, I, didn't, I didn't know that because I was in Worcester Crown Court, so I didn't realise it we got back to Hereford. And, um, you know, it's not every day that we can that the judge sticks one into the CPS itself. Uh, and I mean, what the costs are going to be, God only knows. Yeah. Guy, I'm, I'm going to say thank you very much for giving us that report. I've got a bit of an eye on the on the clock here. Sorry, but, um, I ramble, you know me. <laughs> no, no, it was absolutely brilliant. And of course, the key thing is that um, we know, Guy, that you are self-taught in the law. You've you've spent um, a large number of years now investigating and learning yourself. And so what you've demonstrated for us today is that uh, basically uh, people can, if they put the time and effort into it, take on the establishment. 
and uh, not only go into court and win, but of course, I would suspect that that judge has actually started to think for himself uh, because, of you, as you've said, a fraudulent warrant was used and it would appear that the uh, Crown Prosecution Service was, was teamed up, was collaborating uh, with British Gas. I would actually use a different phrase. I would say they were working to a common purpose. And of course, I'm deliberately using that because common purpose is a crime um, at law. So we'll, we'll leave people to check that. But thank you very much, Guy. We will we'll help uh, publicise that article. And uh, we just say to viewers um, and listeners that, uh, of course, next year we're going to be doing many more reports on, on the sort of work that Guy and Roger Hayes, for example, have been doing. And we know that magistrates and indeed judges are starting to uh, realise they have been duped themselves and the truth is uh, starting to come to the surface within our judicial system. So thanks very much for joining us, Guy. No problem. OK. I mean, uh, could I one last thing if I can? Certainly. Right. Well, a very wise friend of mine, a very old wise friend of mine, said to me, what's happening? Rather than just there being, you know, because I've been going and claiming fraud in the court and I couldn't believe that how endemic it was. But what he said to me is, it's the culture. And you think, well, that's silly. But if you get a new job in a factory and you, you're pushing boxes around, you know, you, the boss tells you what to do and all the lads in the factory say, oh, you don't do that. You do it this way, do it this way. And you develop into the culture of it. And then 10 years later, when, you know, the time of it comes down, it says you're not operating to the prescribed form. The thing doesn't stand up, yeah? And, that's, and I think a lot of that is what's been going on. So, you know, by... by the process, examining forensically the process and procedure in these matters, and I mean really examining every stage of the way, that to it, making sure it's operated in its prescribed form. Doing that, we can uproot this bad culture. People who are actually doing their jobs in these places may, will have to start in their jobs again, Brian. So Yeah, brilliant. Okay. okay. Thanks very much, Guy. Thanks for joining us. Well, we, we often don't plan things. We, we uh, put various pieces of the news together at fairly short notice. But it is quite incredible that uh, Guy has mentioned Neath uh, Port Talbot there in relation to the fraudulent warrant. Uh, well, we've got some more good news coming from the Neath Port Talbot area, and uh, it's to do with the Linda Lewis campaign and um, Kevin Edwards from, from Justice for Linda Lewis. Um, now, if you haven't been to this uh, website before, the address for the, it's a blog spot, the address there is at the bottom. Uh, the story is an incredible one. It is about a young girl who was taken away from her mother many years ago uh, on false pretenses. Uh, she was in pain. The mother was trying to uh, get her properly diagnosed, could not achieve it, eventually took her daughter to America for an opinion at a Florida hospital at the hospital, Neath Port Talbot social workers turned up with American social workers and armed police and the daughter was taken from her mother and grandfather, flown back to UK on a false passport uh, and uh, the young lady was initially put in a psychiatric unit and told that her pain was imaginary. Now, we've had some extraordinary developments with this case, but I just wanted to show you the sort of thing the young lady was saying herself at the time. If you can just bring that one back, Mike, we should be able to expand. This is a letter from, from the young girl herself. I may not be able to read all of it. Some of the writing is a, is a bit difficult for me. Um, what she's saying is, I'm not allowed to tell my mother that I'm in pain. I'm not allowed to tell you that I love you not to say I want to come home, not to talk to my friends in school about my pain, not to say I love my nan and granddad and that I'm in pain. And if I say it to my mum, they will stop contact, never see you again. Julie Reznicek, and I uh, can't read the next bit, have told me I'm never coming home. Please, ma'am, can I come home? I love you loads and loads. I love you. So this was the terrible pleading message from a young girl who had been taken away from her parents. Now, we have constantly uh, worked to support Linda and Kevin in broadcasting the truth about this case. 
But I have to say that in the last couple of days, there's been the most incredible breakthrough. And that is that the Welsh Assembly has finally admitted in writing that there never was a pickup order in relation to this case. And this means simply with no question whatsoever that when the girl was taken by Neath Talbot social workers in America, she was effectively being kidnapped. And the fact that she was brought back to UK on a false passport represents trafficking. So as a result of the fantastic work that uh, Linda has done, as a mother would, of course, but also supported by Kevin and many, many other people in the South Wales area, finally, good people in the establishment are starting to pass out in uh, written documents the very evidence that we need to get those who were responsible for these criminal actions brought to justice. And it's our pleasure to actually bring this gentleman up on screen. This is David Rees, one of the Welsh Assembly members. Uh, the comments on his picture there uh, actually come from um, Kevin's own blog spot. So on behalf of all of us worldwide involved as a team, and we are a team who fully support Linda in her fight for justice, may I thank David Rees on everyone's behalf for sticking his neck out in the pursuit of truth. Well, we're just going to put up another little part of um, Kevin's website. Uh, we've got a couple of fine lions there. The truth is like a lion. You don't have to defend it. Let it loose and it will defend itself. So we're going to say what a wonderful way to, for us anyway to end 2013 with two brilliant stories there of how the persistence of good men and women in the general public is now starting to produce really quite major results. And as we always say to you, we don't need violence, we don't need bad language, we don't need threats to people. Uh, what has to be done is that we have to stand up and uh, produce the truth and keep at it. Uh, we've been told from many quarters that uh, there are some amazing changes uh, happening in the judiciary at the moment. We also know that's happening within Britain's police force. And I'll just say that a couple of days ago, I met a solicitor who was very upset about receiving a fine as a result of a parking in, uh, incident. Um, when I started to gently have a discussion on common law, it was interesting to learn that that person was already starting to research for themselves. And as they say to me, the thing is, Brian, we were never really taught about common law. What an amazing thing, really, for a solicitor to say. But of course, we know there's also barristers in the same position. So before we do a quick advert for Doomwatch, which is on tonight, um, we're going to say thank you very, very much to all the people who have stayed with us, support us, and particularly those who subscribe or make donations. Without your generosity, we couldn't do what we do. Uh, we've got some great news planned for next year uh, to do with um, how we get information out and the sorts of um, programmes and, uh, and interviews we can run. We are going to stay looking at the actual facts. We're going to be digging into Cameron's big society and how he is using this pernicious Saul Alinsky agenda to actually destroy the fabric of our society. If we see it and identify it, uh, we act as the lions, uh, we can deal with it. So Doom Watch uh, will be on at six o'clock tonight. And uh, Mike and myself are going to be guests. And uh, with, together with Alex G, we're going to be having a look at uh, 2013 and what's been happening in the year. So if you've got time, join us for that. And uh, that'll be our last um, uh, broadcast for this year. So finally, then, we're going to welcome, wish you happy Christmas from all of the UK column staff. Uh, we need an active and very successful new year. We think 2014 is going to be a pivotal year where we need millions of good people to stand up and say, no, we're having some change. But if we're going to, the correct change, that is, what a terrible word. 
if we're going to do that, we also need to be refreshed. So if you're having some time off over Christmas, enjoy yourselves, look after your families, think of others, and we look forward to seeing you 6th of January 2014. Thanks very much for joining us. Bye-bye.